Hey, Silligurke hier auf dem gratis erreichbaren Minecraft-Server Lasergurkenland mit der Domain silligurken.com, alternativ auch erreichbar unter der IP-Adresse 149.202.127.134. Willkommen zurück zu dieser Dauerwerbesendung. Ähm, ja, wir sind hier immer noch äh, weiter am Laufen vom Spawn weg, denn am Spawn gibt es keine Regeln, wie sonst auch überall auf dem Server, aber da hier so wenige Leute sind, kann man auch ein bisschen vom Spawn weggehen und ist dann eigentlich auf der sicheren Seite und kann hier einfach entspannt Vanilla spielen. Ähm, kann ich euch nur empfehlen. Much wow, much fun. Ähm, ja, alle gerade hier beitreten, bitte danke. Ähm, wir schauen heute weiter ähm, den Full Ethical Hacking Kurs auf dem Free Code Camp Channel äh, freecodecamp.org äh, der Talk oder beziehungsweise dieses, dieser Kurs ist von The Cyber Mentor die haben das nur gereuploadet ähm, ja, ich fühle mich auch ein bisschen schlecht nicht das Original zu schauen, aber ähm, genau dann würde ich sagen, uh, let's go. First responders and military vets, military active, doesn't matter. Um, you just gotta let me know ahead of time. And um, we can work it out. It's gonna be 20% discount if that's, if you guys want to retake this course. Uh, but anyway, so let's go ahead and talk file transfers. So tonight we're gonna do file transfers with Linux. Typically Linux file transfers include uh, wget, so we're going to look at wget, and then we're going to look at uh, some Windows tools. We're going to look at HTTP, FTP, Metasploit, CertUtil. Sick in the Minds already getting ahead of me with um, tools. Uh, my disclaimer here is that these are not all inclusive. There are many more, um, many more tools that you're going to be able to use uh, for file transfers. These are just some of my favorite ones. There's PowerShell. There's SFTP. There's all kinds of cool little tricks that you're going to learn along the way. I'm just going to show you some of the basic ones. So, um, and hopefully you learn a couple of cool little tricks, especially with what we're about to see in, uh, in our file transfer lab. So, without further ado, I'm going to open up my VM here, and we're going to start with Linux. So with Linux file transfers, we've already covered wget, right? We can go pull down a file um, off the web if we want to. Um, you know, we could actually pull a file, I believe, from ourselves. So we could host up a file. Let's try that. And so all I'm doing right now is I am hosting, um, I've got a folder called files, and we just say ls. I've got a file called secrets in there. Literally nothing in there, but something that says secrets. And what we can do is we can host a Python server. Now remember, I covered Python servers back during Python lessons. Uh, but in case you forgot, python-m here. And we are going to do simple HTTP server. And you could just type in 80 for port 80. Let that run. So anything that's in this location here, the secrets.txt, is going to be out on the interwebs. And so all you would do is go into your interwebs, and you can go to your own IP address. I'm sitting at 202.128, I believe, today. So we got the secrets.txt here, right? And if we come over here, in theory, we should be able to w get our own file. So we get to say http double slash slash. 202.128 slash secrets.txt. And you can see that we grabbed secrets.txt and I put it as a dot one because it already exists in the folder. And then if you come over to here, you see that it actually shows that we grabbed it. So somebody came in here and made some sort of grab. So we know that wget works. Now, there are some additional cool tricks that we can do uh, with wget, and one thing that people don't know is that you can actually push out files from wget. So, let's cancel this HTTP server here, and let's do, instead, let's set up a netcat listener. So we're just going to say netcat and let's just put it on port 8081. Okay, so 
So now imagine this scenario. You are on a machine that you have exploited. You set up a listener here. And what you can do with wget is there's actually this module in there. If you say dash dash post file like that. And then let's just say we want to get rid of this secret, right? Secret.txt. And we want to we want to send it out. Actually, let's do something better. This is more practical. Let's say we want to send out the FD password or the FD shadow file, right? You can do this, and then you just type in an IP address, 128, and then you type in the port number at the end of it. it says awaiting response, but if you come over here, look what this came through. So it comes through like it is a uh, with a web header, right? And then I've got the whole file that just came through here. So this is a quick way to dump files off to yourself that I feel like a lot of people don't know about. It's pretty neat. Um, so that's a, a neat little way to transfer files back and forth using wget with Linux. Uh, so let's talk about Windows while we are at it. So you just saw, um, I talked about HTTP. You just saw me spin up a file server here. So python-m, the m, somebody asked what the m is for, it's the module. Um, so we've got the dash m and we're just listening on port 80 for any traffic. Now if we were on a RDP machine, then we would just come in, right? We'd say, oh, I'll just go down to the web server. That's easy. Um, we've got GUI access, right? And we'll just download the file. And if we click on it, you'll see that traffic comes through and somebody made a get request to that secrets.txt. It just says secret. So that's a common way, a really common way if you've got access, uh, GUI access to a machine. Uh, but the rest of the ways I'm going to show you are for if you don't have GUI access to a machine. And let me actually make uh, this full screen here so you guys can see. So I'm going to power on my Windows 10 machines. Um, and I've got this lab set up for pivoting, so let me see which one is which. Okay, so for, for you guys, you can log in either one. Um, but I'm going to be logging into Frank Castle's machine. So this is the first machine that we set up. And again, from Frank Castle's machine, anybody on, the, anybody on the network can go to that location. See, I've already got it up, but secrets.txt, secrets.txt.1 is in here. Um, another thing that we can do while we've got this running, so um, imagine this scenario. You don't have GUI access, but you do have access via a shell. Uh, there is a wonderful tool. Now, I will note that this tool has been getting blocked lately by Windows Defender. And I've actually gone in and turned Windows Defender off in um, in group policy. So if you want to do that as well on your machines, like some people were saying that the machines were, were, um, were turning Windows Defender back on after a reboot, and that is pretty accurate. You can go into the, your GP edit on your local machine and just go into here. And then there's actually a setting if we go into, uh, let me cheat and look at my notes. So if we go into the administrative templates, and then uh, I believe it's Windows components, and then there should be a Windows Defender antivirus right here. So there's this little policy that says turn off Windows Defender antivirus. If you double click on that and you say enable, it should be not configured by default. If you say enable, this will turn off the policy, or this policy will turn it off. You just hit OK, then you reboot, and you are good to go. So if you want to do that for all your machines, you're more than welcome. Um, if not, you may have to turn off Windows Defender again tonight for some of the activities that we're going to be doing. Anyway, so there is a tool that I like to use. If you go into Command Prompt, this simulates what a shell would be like. Um, what we're going to do is we are going to use a tool called CertUtil. Uh, this is fairly common, and I don't feel like a lot of people know about it. So if we say, apparently I'm not typing in here. We say cert util, and it's built in to, uh, to almost all of Windows like for a, a long time now. I couldn't tell you where. Um, but this is kind of the equivalent of a, uh, of a wget. So you say dash url cache, a dash f for file, and then you just grab the file you want. So. Say 202.128 slash secret dot 
TXT. Pull it down. You say dir. And oh, I messed up. You gotta name your file. So we'll just call it secret.txt like this. And then it says completed successfully. Put the dir. And then you see the secrets.txt is here. We can type it, make sure it actually came over correctly. And you see it says secret. So that's a neat little way. Um, there's some more advanced methodology behind this too. There's actually a way to split the files and then rejoin the files to kind of bypass um, some antivirus. I've never actually had it work, but I've read blogs on it where it, it shows it working. So there's some, some little tricks on that on the more advanced side. But just know that cert util, especially if you're doing things like uh, capture the flag or you know hack the box, even OSCP stuff. This is a neat little trick that you can use to bring files over. So on top of that, there is one more trick that I would like to show you, and that is FTP. And let me make sure that is the only trick I want to show you. I don't have all my notes up. Let's see. Uh, where's my PowerPoint? HTTP, FTP, oh yeah, and Metasploit, of course, Metasploit. Um, so we can also spin up a FTP server. Now if we come back into here and we kill this, now with Python, we can spin up a quick FTP server module as well. It's called pi FTP, you just type that out and hit tab. Um, and then you do a dash P for port, and 21 like this, start running it. Now, some of you might be trying to run this and it's not working. Um, the reason that would be is because you didn't install it. If you've been following from week one, I had you install this either week one or two, one of the early weeks. Um, I believe you can just do a pip install of pi ftpdlib and that should get you where you need to be. Um, but either way, just like the port 80 web server we just spun up, this is the port 21 FTP server that we're spinning up. We can come onto our Windows shell and we can say FTP and then type in the address you want to go to. It's going to say, okay, you've connected. What's your password, username and password? Just type in anonymous. Anonymous, preferably wearing your Guy Fox mask, right? And then you are here. So you could say dir. And again, same thing. Um, it's going to put it, what, all the files that it's going to share are right in the folder that you spin it up in. So again, we have the secrets.txt. You can type in, I think it's help to find all the uh, things that you can do. But you can put files in here uh, with put. So you can transfer files out. And you can also get the files um, from this folder as well. So you would just say get secrets.txt. Uh, so it's fairly straightforward. One of the easier ways to transfer files as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and exploit um, our machine again. We've got this Windows 10 machine here. Remember, we have a PS exec exploit for it. So I'm going to exploit the machine, and we're going to just kill this. And I've got some questions coming through. Is there any reason why you shouldn't do it in Bash service VAS TPD to start? Um, because that turns it on permanently. This is just an easy on-off, right? So you've got your service up, and then you've got your service off. It's the same thing with the web server. Like, the web server is running, and then it's not running, right? Um, the other way is you start up your, your web server with, like, a, say, Apache, then you have to go put it in your folder. Like, you have to go put it in your www folder to share it out. Um, here, you can just share the folder, what you've got right away. You don't have to go put things and items and locations you want. It's just an easy spin up. So it's, it's instant, and that's, this is why a lot of people have moved to Python for, for spinning up these quick servers. Okay, so let's get into, let's get into Metasploit. And if I'm going too fast, guys, let me know. Um, I'm just trying to get through everything tonight. And I saw some people came in. Hey, Jeff, how's it going? Hey, Dan, nice to see you, man. Okay, so we are going to exploit our Frank Castle machine one more time. So we're going to say use exploit Windows SMB PS exec. Should be familiar from all the previous lessons. We say option. Okay, we're going to set our R host. 
my R host for this machine, I think, is 134. I don't want to be wrong here. Okay, it's 202.134. We're going to set the uh, SMB domain as Marvel, set SMB pass as password1, set SMB user as F capital. And let's set the target as 2. Remember it's got the automatic target and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Let's see if this even works. Denied. That's okay. We'll try again. Try again, try again. Okay, we've got our shell. So, one of the nice little features about Metasploit is it's got a lot of stuff it can do. We've been doing pretty much all of our work in Metasploit. Um, it is so robust and so awesome. I'm the biggest fan, skitty, whatever you want to call me when it comes to Metasploit. I'm, I'm all about it. So, if you come in here, and you say, there is an upload and a download. I might go buy it. I don't know. I'm not good at seeing things. Just just trust me. Okay, there it is. Upload and download. You pretty much have full control anyway here. So you could say, like, um, I think there's, like, present working directory. Okay, we're in system 32. Um, we can change the directory to C users. And then we say PWD like that. Note that I put in the second slash there for character escaping. So we're in the users folder. If we say dir, okay, there's a couple users. Um, so what I want to do is I want to um, I want to upload this secrets file into this folder. So we're just going to say upload secret. And you could do this, you know, you could do this with any file. It doesn't have to be in the directory you're in. You could say root. Um, what do we put it? File secrets.txt, something like that. And then if you want to put it in this folder, you would just say secrets.txt, or you could say let's just put it in the C drive, right? Something like that. You just got to declare where you're putting the folder or the file. And then it says it uploaded it to the C drive. Let's go check out our C drive. And there it is. Secrets. So, same concept, right? We can download that file. To our maybe, maybe not. Oh, because I didn't declare dot text. I'm getting all fancy here. There you go. So we can also download the file and Metasploit, one of the fastest ways. If you got a Meterpreter shell, you might as well just use this to transfer your files instead of doing it through a shell yourself. Um, one of my absolute favorite ways. So while we are in Metasploit, um, let's talk our next PowerPoint section. So put this in the wrong order, so let's go back. And we're going to talk about maintaining access with Meterpreter. So we've got um, a few different things I want to talk about. Uh, we've got, these are all in Meterpreter, like I said. We've got persistent scripts, we've got scheduled tasks, we've got uh, met SVC. Now, I'm not going to be showing you any of these tonight. These are these are likely really not going to come up in a junior level pen test. I don't, honestly, I don't see persistence much. Uh, like, for example, the run persistence, this dash H is just a dash help, and I can show you that. Like, we could talk about it. Let's go back. Um, this is just like a really, it's like a really dangerous thing to run. And you say dash H like this. And so you have to declare all these values, right? But what it does is, okay, what options do I want? Do I want to um, do I want to automatically start an agent when it boots 
as a service. Do I want to start an agent when the user logs in? Do I want to start an agent when the system boots? Um, what's the IP of the system that we're going to reach back to? What's our IP, our attacker IP? Do I want to set a port, right? Now, if you go and read the Metasploit documentation, you read Metasploit Unleashed, it tells you that this is a very, very dangerous module to run, that really as a, a penetration tester, you don't need to be running this unless you, you absolutely need to. Um, and the main reason is, is it just opens up a port on a machine. That port doesn't have any credentials. You just basically connect back to it, right? So um, you're just leaving it wide open for a future attack, and you actually have to go back in and delete the service. It does input it into the registry. You have to remove it from the registry. This will give you an RC file if you're connected to go in and actually delete all those files for you. So it does have some cleanup. Um, but, but tools like this are dangerous and there's not a lot of need for them when it comes to, um, when it comes to, I would say, junior or mid-tier level pen testing. If you're doing red teaming or something where you're being very, very discreet and you need a computer, you're on a host and you don't want to lose access to that host, that's a, a completely different situation. But when you're in a time-limited engagement, um, chances are you're not going to ever need this. So I'm only going to show you the high levels for this. We're not going to go too deep into it because it's just going to be um, deeper than we need to go. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. So we can do it through persistent scripts. There's a few here. Uh, exploit Windows local persistence is pretty close, if not the same thing, because it's persistence SH. It just uh, allows you to upload malware. There's actually some, if you do a show advanced, it allows you to use your own executables instead. Um, there's a registry persistence as well. There are scheduled task persistence, so that way um, you can schedule a task basically to run the same time every day that runs your, your executable, so that way you gain a shell at least at some point, right? And you would just sit there with a listener, and we haven't actually covered the listeners. Um, we haven't actually covered those, and I can show you what I mean by a listener. So you could have like a netcat listener, but um, if you're trying to gain a interpreter shell back, let's just background this session that we've got. So we can use something called exploit multi handler. And if we say options on this, so it doesn't really show you what it does. Um, oops, I moved my screen. I'm sorry, guys. And it cannot go back. There we go. Don't know if you saw that, but sorry, I clicked the wrong thing. Um, so it really doesn't show you what it does here. But what we can do is we actually set a payload. So we'll say, okay, the payload I'm going to be sending through this exploit um, is going to be a Windows interpreter, uh, and we'll just say reverse TCP. Hey, thanks, Matt. I appreciate that. And then you say options again, and now you'll see that it, it gave you this uh, reverse TCP. You might set the L port to something sneaky. You might say set L port to 443 so the traffic goes out on a known port. Um, and then you would set your L host, right? Uh, whatever your IP address. So our, our L host is um, 192.168.202.128. And then you would just say run. Now you can run this with a, a set of switches that will put it in the background and just listen. Um, but just, just to get an example, all you're doing is running a handler. This is very similar to Netcat where you're listening. We're listening right now on 443 for any traffic to come into this IP address. Um, and if it matches this payload, it'll talk back, it'll start up a interpreter shell, and that's how these persistent scripts run with, uh, with malware. So, nice dudes, what the fuck? Other than that, um, yeah, I encourage you to look into these. If you want to play around with these, build your own lab. Just note, again, that um, you're going to scrub the machines when you're done because these do leave open ports, so make sure they're VMs. Or you are closing the registries and uh, open ports when you are done. So going back in, you can also look into NetSPC, similar to the rest, another persistence module. This is not all of them. There are actually a lot of persistence modules in Meterpreter. Um, but these are the generic ideas. You want access to come back to you uh, if you lose it. If a 
machine, like you have a laptop you access and they take it offline because they go home. When they go back, you want it to connect and talk back to you. So that's the thought process. So what's up next? Not cleanup. We're going to go talk about pivoting. So let's talk about pivoting. Okay, so we are going to do a pivoting lab together. We're going to build this out. I've already got mine built out, so I will try to be as patient as I can be. And what we'll do is we will come into here, and let's go into workstation up here. And I want you guys to go to edit, virtual network editor, pivot. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, <laughs> I wanted to use that. In this, uh, in this talk, I guess, but I was afraid that I was going to get sued by friends or something along those lines. Do I send the slides on Discord? I don't ever send the slides out. Um, I could, I don't actually think I have the slides saved, if I'm being honest with you. I've been running the same PowerPoint, just deleting it. Um, but you're more than welcome to take screenshots or whatever you'd like. Um, so this is kind of hard to see, and I don't understand why. What is going on? Um, okay, so you, there we go. So you should see this, something like this, right? And you might just have a 1 and an 8 here. I need you guys to go into change settings. And that's an admin protocol. I'm just going to bring this back over again. Okay, so you've got your auto bridging via net zero. You've also got um, a one and an eight. Go ahead and just hit add network. And I set it to VM net seven. So look at my settings and I'll, I'll go slow as I can with this. Um, go ahead and select host only on these settings. And then at the bottom, we're gonna give it a completely different subnet. We're gonna say 10.10.10.0 with a subnet mask of uh, a WAC24, so all 255s with a zero at the end. And then you should have your typical 192.168 down here with NAT running um, 202.0 is what I'm on, whatever you guys are on. However you've been connecting, you want to use this guy here. So we're going to hit OK. Now. We're going to have to do some things, some editing. Um, here's the situation, here's the scenario. Let's set that up first. We are on a 192 network. And we are attacking a, uh, a network. We've plugged into the network or gained access. We're attacking a network that is this 192. Um, and we've gained access to a machine, and we're going to gain access to a machine. When we gain access to this machine, we realize through um, our enumeration, our post-exploitation enumeration, uh, that it is a dual home machine, meaning that it's running on two different networks. So we see, okay, it's running on a 192 network, and it's running on a 10 dot network. So we have, until this time, not been able to access that 10 dot network. Um, we can only see the 192 network. So what I have done is I've set this up where our Frank Castle machine, if we come into Frank Castle, um, he is running a dual home machine. Now let me blow this up again. You go to the IP config, you can see he's got a 192 address and a 10 dot 10 address. Now we've also got a Peter Parker machine. I'm going to power back on. And I'm just going to log in as the administrator here. Two times the hot action. That sounds sounds about right. All right. Endlich. Oh mein Gott, wie lange hat das denn gedauert? Oh my god, wirf mich nicht so, da rein. These two machines, they can talk, right? But with this machine, we won't be able to talk. We say things. Ist hier auch Wasser okay. in der Nähe? Well, it should be able to talk. It's talking through, it's talking through Metasploit. I got ahead of myself, ja, okay. sorry. 
Also irgendwie hatte ich davor ein bisschen mehr Lack mit dem Namen sehen. should not be talking guys. So if we um if we go in here, this is on its own network, right? And the domain controller is also on two networks. Let's take a look. If I can get out of this screen, now it's not letting me. This. Da muss keiner hin, oder? Okay. So, if we come into here and we say command, you can see that we're running on 192 and we're also running to um, 10.10.10.128. Now, let's talk about the lab setup. And you guys, in theory, it should not talk for you. I've been doing. Um, a lot of pivoting in the last couple of days, so maybe there's something that got set up, some routing table that got configured. Um, I did do an auto route with my interpreter, and it may have set a routing table for me, so um, I'm not sure the reason. Anyway, let's set this up. You're going to have to shut down all of these. So what we're going to do is we're going to shut down all the machines, um, and I'm just going to leave mine on and running, but go ahead and shut yours down. For your machine that we just exploited, the Frank Capsule machine, what you're going to do is you're going to go into, um, you're going to actually, I'll pause it so I can show you. In your shutdown state, we're going to edit the network. I'll pause all these so I can show you. Okay, so if we edit the virtual machine setting, God, I'm in love. I won't be able to do this because I am. Yeah, ich geh's nicht noch mal zurück. I am uh, still powered on technically, just because I'm on pause. I have one network adapter on Frank Castle that is running NAT. I've got another network adapter that is running VMNet 7. Remember, that's the second NIC, right? So Frank Castle is going to have two NICs. And then we come over to Peter Parker. Peter Parker is going to have one NIC, and he's going to be sitting on the 10 network. Oh, da hinten ist so ein Turm. Ja, den kann man noch. Ja, den kann man noch mitnehmen. Ich habe ich keinen Platz im Moment. We are going to come over to the domain controller. <sighs> and we are going to say. I've got a VMNet 8, it's the same thing as NAT. Um, VMNet 8, VMNet 7, so two separate NICs. I can't use the Zelda gar nicht. So go ahead and configure those. I'm going to resume these real quick. And maybe troubleshoot why these machines can talk. Ah, useless crap. Dustin. So now I'm reach the other way. Spinich or is this a seltsames Dorf? What the heck? I wusste gar nicht, kann man die 
mitnehmen. Warte, wenn ich das abbaue. Naja, ich brauche hier keinen. Aber ey, das kriegt man locker so, ab, oder? Another thing to note, once you guys get everything powered mm. back on, is if we come into the network adapter for Peter Parker, I'm just gonna go into network status and then change adapter options. Uh, okay, yeah, we'll go. What the fuck? Das ist ja richtig groß. Ist denn das Villager oder Pillager? Network and Sharing Center, since it wants to be rude. We'll do it that way. Oh, wo ist mein Rottenfleisch, wenn ich es mal brauche? Oh mein Gott, dem hätte ich jetzt. Aber habe ich das nicht in irgendeinem Base liegen lassen? Das ist ein Change, das ist ein Change, das ist ein Change. Ich habe die Preferred DNS für 192.168.202.150 und dann den Alternate DNS auf 10.10.10.128. So it should line up with here, 202.150 and then 128, just so it's talking and if it fails over, it's still talking. Hm. Schräges Dorf. Aber ganz nett. It's not connected to the internet because it's not connected to anything available to be connected to the internet, stick in the mind. It doesn't have to be connected to the internet. For this lab to work. What's important is that we can ping from our Windows 10, is that we can ping the other machine. What I'm troubleshooting, stick in the mind, is why my Kali machine that is sitting on a 192 network is able to talk out to a 10 network that it shouldn't know what it is. This should not be happening, right? And earlier it wasn't happening, so I'm, I'm guessing that I have some sort of route that it learned. And it can't talk back the other way, but it can definitely talk forward, so. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to worry about it. The lab, the lab will hold up for its purpose, guys. All right, how are we doing on the resets? If you're following along, have you reset everything? Are you back up and running? I know this is a little bit of procedure. I just didn't want to have to show all of it. Classic demo problems? Absolutely. Service networking restart, is that what we're saying? Still pinging. It's fine, guys. I'm not going to be too worried about it. So let's continue on. So we'll pretend happily that we are unable to talk to that machine. Um, what we have is access right to a machine in Meterpreter. So let's actually background. Uh, let's go to sessions. Oh, we have no active sessions. We lost it. Never mind. Um, so let's gain our session back. So let's go to uh, use exploit. Windows, SMB, PSXX. Option just to make sure we're all the same. Let's try running it. Okay. Now we can try some pivoting commands. We can first look, I'm actually curious. Um, let's look at the routing table if we've already got some sort of auto route. No routes have been added yet, so. 
Hey, thanks, Grayson. I appreciate that. Um, so we've got no auto routes, but what we can do here is we can say run auto route and then do a dash s, and then we want to connect to that 10 network, right? So we're going to say slash 24. Okay, now if we run the command again, you'll see we have a route in there through session two. Um, so, if we go, actually I want to show you, if we go into a shell real quick. Um, so some things to note, right? So if I am a attacker, an attacker, I want to see if a machine's dual homed. A couple things we can do is we can say route print and we can look at the routing table, right? And the routing table shows us that there's a 10 network and there's a 192 network. Um, so that would be an indicator. You could also look at the arc-a and see the arc table. And you can see that there's a 10 network in here and there's a 192 network as well. Uh, a net stat might show us some things if there's any communication between the, the two. If they're, if they're talking over something, um, you can see a 10 here and a 192 here as well. Um, we can see where it's established, you know, some connection. It's talking out here on 443. Um, so sometimes in lab settings, they've got a, um, a machine talking to another machine for some purpose or another. So if you see a, a connection here over one port to another, you might see that. You might see that in the real world as well. Um, but just things to look out for, this is how you'd be able to identify that a machine is dual homed outside of the IP config, right? Um, but you just want to notice these things. So, control C. Now, we've got our auto route going. Um, now, in theory, we should be able to communicate with that machine that we weren't able to communicate with. Uh, wink, wink, right? So. Uh, we can do some things. We could say use auxiliary. Actually, you could try to background this. We could say use auxiliary scanner, port scan, and then we could do a TCP scan, right? And if we say options, okay, so we can set the R host to 10.10.10. .10 .10 129, and then we get to set the ports, right? It's going to scan 1 through 10,000. Um, scanning on a pivot is incredibly slow, so just for a proof of concept, what I'm going to do is we're just going to, we know that SMB is open because we've opened folders on this in the past, so we're just going to say um, set ports 139, and then we're just going to run this. Okay, and you see that it says port 139 is open on that machine, right? So we're, we're going through the machine that we exploited and we're scanning against it. Um, now, I wasn't able to get this to work, but I will try for some on-screen magic and see if we can get it to work. Um, we could try using uh, the exploit again. Say that we dumped hashes or we knew credentials or something, right, and we've got local hashes, and we want to pass the hash around to this new network. Um, we could try to use the exploit again with SMB PS exec and see if they work. Um, if we go options, we know that the, the R host is 10.10.10.129. Uh, .10 .10 and I'm going to change the L port all fives. Now the marble is still the same, but let's change the SMB user to administrator. Just for proof of concept, set the SMB pass to what we've been using. Let's hit run. Ah, I heard a ding in the background. Uh, chances are it blocked it with Defender, would be my guess. Okay. Yeah, I'm not going to worry too much about it. 
We can do the details. Um, it sounded like it, it, it blocked it. That's typically what happens. Um, but just know as a proof of concept that you can run these exploits through one machine to another. This is the idea of pivoting. Um, and yeah, so if you see a dual home machine, you might be able to transition off of one network into another network, uh, leverage that access, and navigate around. Would you often exploit users with Windows Defender disabled on pen tests? Um, you would be surprised. A lot of places aren't using Windows Defender. Uh, Windows Defender has really just stepped up its game is what's going on. Uh, but it doesn't mean that places are patching and allowing their Windows machines to update for these. Um, they might be using other antivirus that doesn't pick up on this. You might use obfuscated malware um, and concepts to try to log in instead. Uh, that's why the PS exec has got the PowerShell. It's got, um, you know, it's got different options. You might try to to do different things to get around it. Uh, so, good question, though. All right, and that's really it for the pivoting section. Let's talk really quick about cleanup. So again, we're going to just talk cleanup. We're not going to actually demonstrate. And now this cleanup that I'm providing is in regards to pen testing. The other cleanup that you hear about in the, the hacking methodologies um, is more about, you know, removing your track completely, you know, like eliminating logs, uh, any sort of system events, proof that you were there at all, right? Um, this type of cleanup here is, is more geared towards pen testing. This is what this is, an actual, you know, a realistic network pen test course. So uh, just a few notes, and the source is down here from where I stole all these from. Uh, but you're going to want to remove any executable scripts or temporary files from a compromised system. If possible, use secure delete method for removing the file. Right? You want to get rid of all the malware you put on the system. Uh, you don't want to leave that. You want to return all the original values for the application parameters if you modified them. You want to remove any backdoors, like you saw with the persistence, any of those. Any user accounts you created, a lot of times you'll create an account to access a machine or to plant a flag or whatever. Um, any of these accounts, you want to delete them when you're done. Um, so you want to leave it like you found it, right? Uh, you don't want anything in there that is malicious or could lead to a breach or something, a weakness for the, the client at a later time. So you need to make sure that you're, you're cleaning up your mess is essentially the, the whole point behind this. So that's that's all my speech for cleanup, and that's really it. Um, let me bring you guys back. I'm gonna grab a drink of my monster. We are on decent timing, actually. Okay, so next slide. We're gonna get into the legal and the documentation. So we're going to talk really quick about the sales, um, some of the before you test and the after you test. We're going to go through the uh, through a sample report and talk about that as well. Uh, so in the sales process, when you first meet your client or you sit down and you want to talk to your client, and most of these you're probably never going to deal with, maybe as a manager level you might deal with some of these um, but you're going to have a mutual non-disclosure agreement, meaning that you're not going to give out the client information and the client's not going to give out your information that you don't want them to give out. So whether that's pricing structure or your sales methodology or any documentation you give them, it's all under NDA. And whatever they tell you about their network, you can't go tell somebody else about that, right? Um, on top of that, you're likely to have some sort of master service agreement. Now, I linked one for Rapid7. All you really have to do is just type in uh, Master Service Agreement pen testing, and all of these, the big names will come up with their own Master Service Agreement. They're all public knowledge out there. Uh, it's basically just a contractual document. Um, so it just says, like, 
these are the performance objectives and um, you know what the, the responsibilities are of both parties. It's just all legal mumbo jumbo, uh, but it's the, the agreement you sign before doing work. Uh, on top of that, there is a statement of work, which is your what activities you're going to do, what deliverables are you going to provide, what timeline you're going to provide them on, right? Um, so, like, I'm going to do a web application assessment. Uh, I'm going to deliver you a report when it's done, and I will get you that in two weeks' time. And that's your statement of work. Um, you're likely going to have costs on there, what the costs are going to be, um, and what the um, payment terms are going to be as well. So, and sometimes you'll see that the statement of work, it's also sometimes the rules of engagement as well. Um, some places I see split them out, some places they're both the same thing. Once the statement of work is signed, this rules of engagement is signed. Um, so, but before you test, regardless, you need that statement of work slash rules of engagement to, um, to go, right? Because your rules of engagement also has your scope details, like you can't attack this specific machine, or you can't use social engineering, or you can't perform denial of service or you can't use this certain tool, right? Like, you need to know what you can and can't do, what machines you can and can't attack. Um, that's very critical that you stay in scope because if you go out of scope, you can get in uh, pretty big trouble. So I said CYA, cover your ass. This is a cover your ass document, right? Um, other process in the sales, you're gonna probably have a sample report that you give to the client. You probably wanna have recommendation letters, et cetera. So, any of these um, things that you can give to a client or potential client and say, hey, here's more about me, the process, whatever. Um, this all helps in the sales side of things. Uh, so after you are all said and done, you do your testing, uh, you have a report to deliver. Now I have released this report on GitHub. Um, I'm also gonna show it to you here. There's a video on YouTube. It's all over the place. So if you wanna see this again, and you don't like this presentation, then you can go watch it elsewhere, download it, play with it, do whatever. So this is your, yours to use, yours to modify, yours to do with whatever you want. Um, just uh, make it your own, you know? So um, this is just a standard idea. I'm actually gonna make this a full screen. So standard idea of how I would organize this um, when I actually give this to clients, I'm going to have a little bit more details in here. So this is going to be bare bones for you guys. Um, but it, it's going to be the same, pretty same or close structure when I actually give this to clients as a sample report. Uh, so you see here, I've got the header. It says Demo Company Security Assessment Findings Report. It's business confidential. Uh, it's got today's date on it. It's got a project number, version number. Again, business confidential, blah, blah, blah. You've got a fancy table of contents. Okay, and then at the top, you've got a confidentiality statement. It just says that this is between demo company and TCM security, and it contains confidential information. Uh, basically, you're not going to duplicate, redistribute this in any part or form without the consent of both parties. Um, so, on top of that, it says, you can share this document um, if we need to. Actually, this says TCMS, this should probably say DC. You can share this document with auditors under non-disclosure agreements to demonstrate penetration test requirement compliance. Um, so sometimes you have audits and compliance requirements. So it's not saying that you can't share it, but as long as the other people are under non-disclosure, that's fine. Um, here is a disclaimer. The big thing that you wanna note to potential or to clients is that a penetration test is considered a snapshot in time. Uh, the day after you finish your test, an exploit can come out, a misconfiguration can occur, something can happen that causes um, a vulnerability, right? And you want to make sure that they're aware of that. You also want to make sure that they're aware that this is a time-limited engagement. Um, if you're only given a week, chances are you're not gonna find every single thing on an assessment, especially if the assessment's full of vulnerability. Um, so what we say is we prioritize them to point out the weakest controls, and then we gave them full report information for further details. Um, on top of that, you always want to include contact information. So who are the 
Uh, important contacts from the company you're pen testing. Who are your important contacts here? Okay, you're going to give an assessment overview. You're going to say, hey, we were engaged from these dates to these dates, and we evaluated the security posture um, based on best practice, and that included, this is just an external penetration test for this one, but if you had more components, then you would list those in there. Um, all testings performed on the NIST SP800 guideline. Also, we do tests on the OWASP testing guideline and customized testing frameworks. Um, these phases of a penetration test come from the NIST SP800. So there's planning, discovery, attack, reporting. You just talk about what that is. Um, I made a tiny little infographic here that shows, you know, you do planning, you do discovery, you do attack, you report on what you attack, but then if you also get in, you do some additional discovery, repeat the process, and report. Um, so with that, you also want to include the assessment components that you perform, right? So you're performing an external penetration test. So this just gives a high-level overview of what an external penetration test is. Uh, it says we're going to use OSINT, employee information, historical breach information, and we're going to perform scanning and enumeration to identify potential vulnerability in hopes of exploitation. Uh, so if you had an internal, you would know what that is. You would know uh, web app, you know, social engineering, whatever the engagement, you would have a list of all your components. So coming through here now, we've got a finding severity rating. This just says what the ratings might be from critical to informational, what the CVSS V3 score is uh, comparatively for those, and what the definition is. Like a critical is exploitation super easy. Um, it, it led to like a system level compromise, RCE, some sort. You need to plan uh, an action right now and patch immediately. Where a low is like, yeah, it doesn't lead to an exploit, but you know, best practice states that you should probably patch it in the next maintenance window. Um, but you know, not a big deal if you don't. So um, we have this findings chart just so you know the customer is aware what um, what each finding means. And then going through that, this page is it's a little lackluster. I want to add some more to this, um, but you always want to include the scope. And there would be a, um, you know, there'd be more information here for every assessment component you did. So if there was an external and internal web app, you would give all the details of what you tested. Now I know these are internal IP addresses. I wasn't going to put external IP addresses out there because somebody probably owns those. Um, but you would just say, hey, I tested this range and this range, whatever. Um, and then full scope information is provided in a additional full findings Excel document. That's where you list out all the findings that you found with notes on them. Um, and then you would say, like, if you had 50 IPs you were testing against, you might not list them all here. You might just say, I'm testing against 50 IP addresses. Um, other than that, you want to have the scope exclusions, right? So we didn't perform any denial of service attacks during testing. Um, on top of that, we have client allowances, right? So did they provide us a password? Did they provide us, um, you know, any sort of things that allowed us um, any kind of help on this testing? You want to notate that. So, um, on top of that, scroll down. Now, you want to do an executive summary and you want to do a technical summary, right? So the executive summary is for your C level. The C level just likes to see things. They like to see pretty pictures. They don't really care about the muddy details, right? Um, so you want to give them everything up front that you can give them. So a quick blurb here, it says, we did the testing from this date to this date. By leveraging a series of attacks, we found critical vulnerabilities, and we were able to gain full internal network access to the headquarter office. Um, and then we gave an attack summary of how we were able to gain internal access and some of the recommended uh, remediation. So um, from here, like we obtained historical breach account credentials to leverage against the company login pages. So a recommendation there is to discourage your employees from using work emails and usernames as login credentials to other services unless necessary. Um, all the way down to we leveraged valid credentials to log into the VPN. Well, um, they permitted uh, VPN access, right? OWA did and the VPN did without multi-factor authentication. So we recommend that they use uh, authentication on all services. So on all external 
facing surfaces. So here you would provide some strengths and weaknesses. Um, so an example of a strength is, okay, well their SIM was alerting on vulnerability scans. As soon as we started scanning, they alerted us that they saw us, they verified our IP address, and they had the opportunity to blacklist us from further action. Uh, you would probably want to pri provide here at least three to five good strengths that they had. Um, and you would want to provide, you know, if they had weaknesses, three to five weaknesses. Um, and probably fill out two pages with this. So um, the more information that you can provide, the better. Again, this is just a bare bones report. So here is a vulnerabilities by impact. Basically, this is a chart that says critical, high, low, moderate, whatever. How many vulnerabilities did we find by each impact? Um, there's only one finding on this report, and it was a critical finding, so there's only one critical. You probably put a little bit of blurb down here about um, why the finding's critical and what, whatever, you know, you could add and make this your own. So on top of that, you come down here now and you have the external penetration test finding, right? So you've got the um, insufficient lockout policy. So what it says is the company allowed us unlimited login attempts against their Outlook web app services. Um, this configuration allowed brute force and password guessing attacks in which we were able to gain access to their internal network. Uh, the impact is critical because we did gain access. We note the system that we gained access on and then we provide the references um, of the pages uh, for this. So obviously remote access and then unsuccessful login attempts automatic account lockout, both the NIST SP-800 policy. Um, and then you provide a proof of concept. So, first thing first, we gathered historical breach data, found a credential dump. The data amounted to 868 total account credentials. Now, obviously, we can't put all those on one page. Uh, it would take up many pages, so we're just going to say, hey, we'll throw them in the full findings. That way you can review all the account credentials. Um, here you've got the usernames and passwords, and then it just says sample list of breach user credentials. And then we're just going to go through the whole process. We took those credentials, performed a credential stuffing attack, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we weren't able to gain access with credential stuffing, but Outlook was providing enumeration through uh, username enumeration. So got failed login, but username is valid. So using that, we gathered valid usernames and performed a password spring attack. We used summer 2018 exclamation point. A username return is successful. You see successful login here. Um, and then we would say, we leveraged the valid credentials to gain access to the VPN. There would be a picture here of VPN access. Um, from there, you would want to make a remediation recommendation. Um, so I like to put who, what the vector is, and then what the action is going to be. So who is going to be the IT team? Um, if this was a web app, you would say developer, or if this was maybe more a network side, you would say network engineer. Um, and then you'd say, you know, uh, the vector was done remotely, so it's a remote vector. And then you want to talk about all of the actions that they need to take just through these steps. So, um, item one was, you know, VPN and Outlook web access or uh, did not, or login valid credentials did not require multi-factor authentication. We recommend that they implement multi-factor. So this is again the same kind of recommendations you saw at the high level earlier, um, but you're seeing it down in the weeds again. Um, this gives a little bit more detail, you know, use 14 character passwords or longer, uh, use different passwords for each account access, don't Jesus. use words or Did proper names this? like summer 2018, you know, and uh, passwords. Thank you, Action. Appreciate it. Um, and then you, um, you know, you just come through here and you make all your recommendations. And then you would just continue on with this. You would say, you know, and they might not all be this long and proof of concept. This is a long proof of concept because it led to something. You might just say, hey, this is out of date. This is a medium finding or a low finding. Here's a picture of the version or proof of a version, right? And you'd say. Uh, blah 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 was out of date. Here's proof of concept with a picture, and it might just be easy. And then the remediation might it might all fit on a one page. It says remediation, um, you know, update to latest version. Blah blah blah, and then you put that in the reference. Um, so they're not going to all be long like this, but this is just a good one to show step by step um, and how it works. So on the next page, there's additional.
additional reports and scans. We always give out uh, not only that full findings report, but you would want to give out um, all the Nessus documentation because um, you don't always get to the the every single finding, right? There might show up a hundred and something items on a Nessus scan, um, and you may only be able to do 20 or 30 to check those in a, a time-limited uh, test, right? Depending on how vulnerable they are and where you spend your time, you might not get to everything. So you want Ooh, to provide nice. all the details that you can to the client so they can go through and review those on their own time. And then other than that, you have um, your just the last page here. Uh, some companies will include appendices, appendices. Um, you, you could have whatever you want in there. Uh, you could put the methodology that you see down here in there. You could put the, um, like the severity ratings down the dependency. There might be more detailed information about the scope or, or network penetration test scope or whatever down in, the, um, in there as well. So uh, it's up to your interpretation. So um, always worth considering. Other than that, that is it for the reporting side of things. Okay, one more slide, I think, and then we should be good to go. And I'm looking at my phone is buzzing like crazy. Looks like my uh, my flight got canceled. That, that feels sad. Super sad, guys. Okay. Um, so let's open up. This, and I'm going to take a drink and then I'm going to give you my career advice. Dude, fucking Southwest. You're damn right about it. Alright. So we're going to talk about these in, uh, I guess in this order that I put here. Um, so here is my career advice for those of you seeking to get into the field or work in any field, honestly. Uh, career advice number one is always set goals for yourself and stay motivated. So um, for me, what I like to do is if I've got a certification or something that I want to get done, I will set that certification up. I'll register for the voucher. And I will, um, I will do it, say, like, I want to get it done a month from today. I will buy the voucher and register that exam to sit for it in a month. Um, that way I've got that time pressure, right? Uh, that goal is already there. And that helps keep me motivated. So you kind of want to have these goals and keep motivated. And you've heard me preach about this before, but working in information security, especially the higher up the food chain you get, you're going to... Um, you're going to get left behind if you are not staying motivated. And that falls into, as well, uh, it falls into the do not become complacent. Wow, so what the fuck? What that means is, and I'm going to describe so, so uh, you know, my, my journey upcoming, right? Like, So when I first started out, I started out in help desk. And, you know, I had the opportunity to just sit there and I would go home and I would study. Um, if there was downtime at work, I would study, you know, and I would just knock out certification after certification. Um, and quickly, I rose above my peers, right, because I was just putting in the work. Um, now, you will come across people in every single job that you work, no matter the level of the job, where there is complacency. You will find people who have been on help desk for 10 years. Uh, you will find people who have been in networking for 10 years etc. It does not mean that it's bad, but it is just that if you want to be in information security, you shouldn't be complacent, right? You do not want to be that guy working the same job, getting the same pay. Um, I know a guy that is making, you know, $50,000 a year. He's been in IT for over 10 years. Uh, he may be at like 60000 now. Um, but where I started at 40000 and I was up to 140000 in three years. So, I mean, just, it's all motivation. A lot of it's luck, sure, but like, uh, you put in the time and you put in the effort, you're gonna be rewarded. So, you know, don't be that guy who's who's staying in the same position, in the same job forever. Um, always have that desire and that hunger to, to move up. 
Um, on top of that, you're going to want to never be afraid to apply to jobs that you are unqualified for. If I never applied to a job that I felt like I was unqualified for, I would never have a job because I was never technically qualified for anything. Um, my first job with Help Desk, it was uh, three years of experience, $50,000 a year was what they were offering. They wanted A+, plus, Net+, plus, et cetera. I had no experience in nothing. Um, I got into that interview and, you know, I just told them, like, uh, I don't know anything, but, you know, I'm willing to learn. And those, those go into my next two concepts as well. Um, be willing to admit that you don't know, especially in an interview. Don't try to bullshit your way through things. Just say, you know, I don't know, but I'll learn. Um, you know, or I don't know, but I'll prove myself. So, uh, I, you know, I went into that job and I said, look, I don't, I don't really know how to do this job. I don't got the credentials that you're looking for. But if you give me the opportunity, I will learn and I will prove myself. Um, and, you know, I even said, hey, I'll take less money just to, to come in and, and show you that I'm worth what it is. Um, and I did that. I came in at like 40, I think it was 42 or 44,000. And um, I was over 50,000 within a few months. Like they, they saw that I was putting the effort that I, I really did deserve what I, you know, I said I would and I, I did that. Um, at the same time, with that that job, and it falls into um, another thing. I feel like I feel like I outgrew it, right? Um, and it's part of that complacency. You don't want to be in the same job forever. You want to be able to move up, um, and you want to get smarter, get better. Uh, and if you're outgrowing your job, you need to leave, right? So that falls into uh, the next couple of bullet points here. So first thing is um, you want to determine what you want from a job, right? If you're unhappy, if you feel like you aren't the dumbest guy or girl in the room, which is the next tip as well, if you're not the dumbest guy or girl in the room anymore, it's probably time that you should leave and look for something else. So determine what you want from the current job you're in and for what the next job is and only apply to those jobs that meet your criteria. So I see a lot of people making the mistake of just applying to every single job when they're, uh, you know, like fresh OSCPs, they'll apply to every single job that's out there, um, you know, just to hopefully land something. But, you know, so many of them come back in like five months and say, you know, um, I'm so unhappy at my job. And it's like, well, you took the first thing that was offered to you. Um, so, you know, a job is a huge commitment. You should be... Um, picking your boss more than anything else, right? You want a boss that's going to be good, that's not going to micromanage you, that's going to give you every opportunity to learn, to study, to go to conferences, to give talks, to have a blog, whatever. You want a boss that's going to encourage you to be better and continuously get better. Um, so you need to, to suss that out during job interviews and make sure that everything's a fit. Don't just take the first job offer that comes to you. Um, and it goes back into that point. Like I said, you want to strive to be the dumbest guy or girl in the room. Um, if you are feeling that you are in a opportunity where you're not, it is time to pack up and go somewhere else, uh, especially in information security. You want to be uh, dumb all the time because there are so many smart people around you. So, last but not least, Six years of business school that I went to, the one lesson they repeated over and over and over and over is network, 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 right? You never know who you're going to be nice to, shoot a chat with, um, you know, you might be on a job site one day talking to your future boss. You just don't know. So it's always good to put yourself out there to make connections, make friends, um, and just, you know, let them know who you are. Let them know that you're a talented individual and someday it might just fall back into your lap. Um, you're never going to know what dividends it's going to pay and how long it's going to take. Sometimes, you know, you might not get a call, phone call for five years from somebody that you met, but um, you plant that seed and someday that seed's going to grow and it's all about building this network of people. Um, I'm fully, fully attesting to that. So, like... Like, if you guys watch my, my first video on the entrepreneurship, like, um, I quit my job without another job. And somebody, you know, somebody close to me said, hey, like, I, I 
see you're on the market. Do you want a job offer? And it was easy as that. There was no technical interview. There was no anything. It was like, hey, I know you're capable of doing the work. I've seen you work before. Um, if you're interested in this job and you think it would be a good fit, I'd love to have you on the team. So it was that easy to pick something else up. Not everything in your career as you go up is going to be um, you know, super technical, this and that. It really comes down to who you know. So make sure you're taking your time to network with people. Um, some people are saying business cards. Yeah, get good business cards, even if they're your own your own personal business cards or your company's business cards, you know, just leave that impression, make that connection on LinkedIn, um, and just strive to be a better person every single day. Uh, that is that is it, guys. That's my career advice. That is um, that's it. I think we are we are done, my people. I'm gonna come back to the screen. Wow! Whoa! Wow, Chill. wir sind durch, als ob, das war jetzt ein abruptes Ende irgendwie, <lacht> okay, ähm, hier liegt jetzt irgendwas, ja, das war der Full Ethical Hacking Kurs von dem FreeCodeCamp.org Channel von The Cyber Mentor, also der Channel ist nicht von The Cyber Mentor, aber der, der Kurs, und ich habe mir tatsächlich die ganzen, äh, 15 Stunden reingezogen äh, und habe sicher äh, auch 10 Minuten davon aufmerksam zugehört. <lacht> äh, ja, okay, das äh, war es dann auch wieder mit dieser Episode der Dauerwerbesendung, würde ich sagen. Ähm, natürlich nicht vergessen, hier auf diesem Minecraft Server Laser Land beizutreten und ähm, ein bisschen zu spielen. Die Stars. Bitte nicht mir nachlaufen und meinen äh, Base zerstören, weil ich glaube, ich lasse mich jetzt demnächst hier irgendwo mal nieder. Ich hoffe einfach, dass niemand Bock hat, so weit zu laufen. Deswegen ist es egal, dass meine Koordinaten geleakt sind. Ähm, naja, mal sehen, wie das funktioniert. Ähm, ja, also, äh, genau, IP ist äh, 149.202.137.134. Alternativ gibt es auch die Domain sillyhoom.com. Äh, ja, ich weiß allerdings nicht, ob eine dieser Sachen sich ändern wird, ob es eine neue Domain geben wird, ob es eine neue IP geben wird, ob es beides neu geben wird. Ich halte euch hier auf dem Channel immer am Laufenden. Ähm, aber an sich, auch wenn ihr dieses Video in zwei Jahren seht, ähm, sollte eigentlich mindestens noch die IP, ich weiß nicht, was länger hält, ich weiß es wirklich nicht, aber mindestens eins von beiden sollte wirklich noch ähm, erreichbar sein und der Server sollte hier noch an sein und laufen. Ähm, ja, eigentlich auch ohne Downtime. Hin und wieder ist der Server mal 10 Minuten runter, wenn ich äh, World Backups mache oder so ein Spaß. Aber an sich ist, ist die Uptime schon gut. Der startet auch automatisch neu, wenn er mal crasht. Also eigentlich, eigentlich sollte er laufen. Wenn ich mal wieder vergesse, meinen Server zu bezahlen, kann sein, dass er kurz ausgeht und sowas. Aber ja, an sich einfach mal connecten. Ähm, zur Notentag später wieder probieren, äh, wenn, wenn er gerade aus ist. Was aber eigentlich nicht der Fall sein sollte. Okay, ähm... Ja, das, äh, ich bin gerade ein bisschen hier im, wie soll ich sagen, im, im Delirium, dass ich dieses 15-Stunden-Video fertig geschaut habe. Das war jetzt doch sehr abrupt. Also ich wusste, dass es nur noch 10 Minuten sind, aber dann plötzlich, also kein, ähm, wie heißt das? Oh, wie heißt dieses Wort? Ähm, sentimentales Gelaber mir am Ende von ihm. Vielleicht wurde das rausgeschnitten in der YouTube-Version. Ich glaube nämlich kaum, dass er dann seinen Stream so abrupt abgebrochen hat. Naja, ähm, ja, cool. Dann äh, seid ihr Zuschauer jetzt alle zertifizierte Ethical Hacker. <lacht> naja, obwohl ich habe hier nur noch ein paar Folgen am Ende geschaut. Was war das? Ein, zwei Stunden maximal. Ähm, Ja, vielleicht sogar drei. Ähm, ja, einfach die, die paar zehn Stunden, die davor noch hängen, 
nachschauen und dann seid ihr auch zertifizierte Hacker, so wie ich. Und, ähm, und <lacht> genau. Aber äh, darum geht es hier ja gar nicht. Es geht nur darum, dass ihr hier auf diesen Server beitretet. Ähm, ja, das ist doch ein guter Platz hier, um die Folge zu beenden. Dann sehen wir uns in der nächsten Folge der Dauerwerbesendung, wenn wir den nächsten 15-Stunden-Kurs durchschauen. LOL. <lacht>